and to think that the economy doesn't need a recession. We've had a recession every decade since I've been born. Just as necessary as the booms. They just should last shorter, which they do. In today's video, Harry Dent, author of Zero Hour, talks about what's up with bonds, the next moves of the Fed, the raging inflation and the coming recession. Dent has been predicting a great reset of the biggest financial asset bubble in history. The market historian predicted a painful crash in stocks and an economic depression, and discusses the next moves before the big crash. He believes that the top is in and the Fed is tightening aggressively. Could the markets make a new high? The U.S. is the Bureau of Labor has conducts surveys of consumers every year, in-depth, 600 categories, down to hot dogs and potato chips, you know, and housings and starter homes and trade-up homes and nursing, you know, I mean, everything. Yeah. So what I found real quickly when I started studying this data for my new venture clients in the early 80s, oh, my God. This this is the golden grail here, okay? Uh -huh. Because what it showed me is the average person, and averages are everything when you're looking at the macro picture, enters the workforce 20, earns and spends more dramatically as they're raising their kids until they get them through school, through high school or college at 46 on average, and then they spend less the rest of their life. And they invest more, and then they retire, and they die. So spending less is deflationary, and dying is the ultimate deflationary act where things disappear. So so demographics are destiny. And for the first time, I just happen to be looking at demographics for my own clients when the Bureau of Labor started doing these annual yeah. <laughs> unbelievable data dumps. Yeah. They surveyed thousands of households. Again, down, you know, when the potato chips peak, 42. You know why? Average kid born at 28 to their parents and has the highest calorie intake in junk foods at 14. 28 plus 14, 42. So if the economy is that predictable down to potato chips, of course it's predictable at the macro sure. level even more. That's what I discovered in my own business research, and then that's when I became an economist. By the way, I did not get a PhD in economics, thank God, because it's useless. <laughs> I started I started with a major in economics. By the third course, I said, I'm learning a lot of in my management, marketing, and accounting courses. I'm not learning crap in my economics courses. This is all theoretical and vague. So, so I became an economist when I discovered this relationship. Oh, it's people, the average person, especially in developed country, are incredibly predictable. Yeah. So you would, you would assert um, that spending wave theory, regardless of the short term, you know, changes and um, uh, whatever panacea that the that the Fed provides uh, that spending wave theory ultimately prevails in the long term. Is that fair? Yeah, yeah. And, and real quickly, I'll show you what it, what it looked like over the last century. Okay, mm -hmm. so so the boom in the nineteen twenty nine and then the crash into forty two thirty two mode, but it didn't turn around until forty two. So that was a long term boom and a bust on the Henry Ford generation. 42 to 68, spending wave of the Bob Hope generation, the World War II generation to follow. They peaked in 68. Ever after that, basically recession, 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 68 to 82 down. So 26 years up, 14 years down, a generational cycle. So the baby boom cycle, largest in history, was late 82 to late 2007. And did the economy peak right on late 2007? As I was telling people what happened in the early to mid 80s, knowing nothing about anything in uh -huh. politics in the future, just because all these baby boomers would predictably spend? Yes. What changed is when they caused the greatest downturn since the 1930s and central banks panic decide, uh-oh, we don't trust free market capitalism anymore. We just got to print money and keep this thing going. You can run an economy on, on endless money printing and to think that the economy doesn't need a recession. We've had a recession every decade since I've been born. Yeah, They are necessary, as I said earlier, just as necessary as the booms. They just should last shorter, which they do. They're the ones that have all the investments. Young people are spenders and borrowers. They're not investors until their 50s on, okay? So this is also a war between the baby boom, aging baby boom, and the rising millennials around the world and the Jenna, everybody past them, okay? So they're the beneficiaries. Real estate has to come down. The average house, people don't remember that just 20 years ago, and inflation has been low since then. It's 100 grand. Now it's 400,000 something. Yeah. The same stupid old house in Ohio, okay? 
This doesn't make sense. How are young people supposed to prosper when they finally get a job and get out of college with all that debt if they went to college? How are they supposed to prosper when they have to spend that much money just to get their first house? Uh-huh. Not a trade up home. That'd be eight hundred thousand. That first tra- home now four hundred thousand. And yeah, maybe their incomes are sixty when their parents used to be forty, but it doesn't matter. This is an imbalance, okay? This has all been because of money printing in this bubble and extending this bubble and nobody wanting a bubble to burst. Um, and of course they shouldn't because bubbles always burst violently and twice as fast as they build. Typical bubble builds in five years and bursts in two, okay, and wipes out all those bubble gains. So That's where we're at. We had the first bubble in 2000. We had a mini bubble in 2007. And now they've created a totally artificial, the first totally artificial bubble in all of history. Okay. Except for the Mississippi Sea bubble way back. Okay. Because they just pumped up one big company. Okay. But that, that's what, that's what's wrong here. Governments took over and said, we don't like free markets anymore because after this great boom in history, we're going to have to have a big slowdown and nobody wants to slow down. Well, I'm sorry, you don't get the booms without the bus. So that's my pet peeve. I, I, I think economists don't understand anything important about the economy, nothing fundamental, because I'm the one that studies people. And I didn't do this. I did this by accident for my own business customers, studying their new baby boom customers. That's how I got onto this accidental economist. I call myself didn't plan to be an economist because I mean, who, how many economists can even get a girlfriend? Okay, I need to say it, but <laughs> it wasn't my goal to be an economist back um, then. Yeah. But, but when you see it, it is simple. And the, it's the average numbers. Enter the workforce 20. Inflation occurs until you enter the workforce because you cost the economy and don't contribute. 20 to 46, you contribute the most in your lifetime and then you slow down and then you invest the most at an exact number, 63. So enter workforce 20, spend the most 46, now going on 47, and, and invest the most money, have the biggest investment before you retire at 63 and people don't retire on average at 65 by the way but it's 63 yeah. if you do the research yeah. so that's all i do look at people people are predictable in mass not individually and people drive our economy and now governments are trying to play monday night quarterback yeah. and screwing it all up we could have been had a deeper recession it would have lasted from 2008 through 2000 mid 2010 like 1929, 30, we could have flushed most of this debt out and zombie companies, and we could be ready to boom again with these millennials. And the truth is we're not going to be able to boom unless we let the economy do what it needs to do, get rid of record levels of bad debts, zombie, zombie companies are record levels, debts at all levels, government to consumer are at record levels and ratios. You have to flush this out. In history, we've always done it, and that's how the next boom happens. Better gem- demographic trends after they slow, and you flush out the inefficiencies and become efficient again. Both those things have to happen to have a healthy boom again. And now all we're going to have is the millennials ready to spend a-, a year from now for the next 13, 14 years. Much shorter mil- generation trend in the U.S., by the way, not so much in Asia and all, but – and and. And we're going to be hampered by, oh, well, we weren't willing to get rid of all this debt and bad companies. So we're dragging these things behind us, a big weight on the economy. Debt, leverage, all those things that you're talking about? Or do you think it'll be hampered and unable to actually, you know, come to fruition as predicted? It, it'll be both. There's no question. This millennial generation will be enough of a force like the baby boom was it's just not as long and not as strong but it it is still we have the best millennial generation in the developed world that's the u.s europe doesn't have this okay yeah uh japan peaked before us and doesn't have it uh korea doesn't have it china actually their demographics are peaking right now and fall for as long as the eye can see okay so so we will this This force will be a positive for the economy regardless. It won't be nearly as positive if these millennials, and they already hate the baby boomers for this. We already took all their job. We already did all this stuff. We've created all this debt. We've created all these bubbles. They know that, okay? Mm -hmm. 
we were the dominant generation. We got our way, you know, and we changed a lot of things for the good. But we brought we were the only generations that brought central banks that just say, well, the best way to grow is just print money. Mm-hmm. Stupidest idea in history. But that came with baby boomers. OK, I hate to say it. And baby boom Federal Reserve chairman as they got older. So so you'll have it anyway, but it will be compromised. No question about it. And I'll tell you another thing. Even if we clear out this stuff in the next few years, which I think is going to happen anyway, okay? I think the economy is going to win here because it's bigger. This boom, the baby boom did happen. I have a 90-year cycle, a super bubble cycle, I call it. It's two technology cycles, and the technology cycles are 45 years. And I'm telling you like a clock on this one versus the generation at 39 to 40, okay? So this, we're in a super bubble cycle that peaked around two, 2019, 20. Now we've extended of all this stuff. So, so it, it's not totally unnatural that we have this bubble here and then extends past the demographic cycles because the demographic cycle may be the most important, but it's not the only major cycle. But if we don't clear this stuff out, we're taking bad debts. That's why the economy, the, 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 George Gilder is my favorite economist, and I've spoken with him a lot in recent years on the same stage. His thing, he says, the secret to capitalism is failure. Yeah, We allow failure. Central governments and, and bureaucratic governments around the world, they try to manage their economies and don't allow failure. And that's what our governments, they're not allowing failure. You have to let a thousand lights bloom and then you have to weed out the failures. There's always going to be failures when there's growth and new technologies and new generations and growth. There's going to be failures. The secret to capitalism is we flush it out as we're going. It's not kept in force by a a top-down government. It's a bottoms-up dynamic system. That was the genius of democracy meets free market capitalism, okay? And, and we're, and we're doing everything against that. We, we, we don't understand why we've gotten so affluent in the last 100, 120 years with those, with those two factors. And now we're doing everything to fight that just to stave off a short term damn downturn. 